Um, the talk I'm giving today is called Forging the Mormon Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith and the plates uh, and the papyri that didn't that weren't returned to heaven, or I should have said weren't returned to Kola. I I gave a I gave a talk with the exact same title 25 plus or minus one years ago here in Salt Lake City. And at that time, I had to wear a bulletproof vest and I had a bodyguard. I say this, and this sounds very funny, but actually there's a sober side to it. The man who was my bodyguard, the man who loaned me his bulletproof vest, was uh, Richard Andrews, who died just a couple weeks ago. Shortly before he died, he sent an email, I think it was to uh, Chris, uh, Chris, and Chris Allen, that he was out of the hospital and he, by hook or crook, was going to get to this convention that he wanted to hear Frank's talk. And so I am dedicating this talk to my dear friend, Rich. I, um, much of my thunder has already been stolen <laughs> by several very, very fine presenters and scholars already today. And so I'm going to try to skip through some things and focus in on just a few things that uh, perhaps need a little more embroidery. But um, we'll try to see how much I can get in in the time that uh, is allotted. I have, I have been in my life at probably over 40 conventions of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in all of those years, I can tell you, I have seen Nobel laureate after Nobel laureate brought humbly down to earth by things like slide projectors. <laughs> and and uh, not that I'm in the, in the same, um, a comparison group as Nobel laureates, but uh, it's good to think about it anyway. <laughs> well, my talk, of course, deals with Joseph Smith, the Randy prophet. You've already, he was a prophet making prophet, by the way. Um, that wasn't funny? <laughs> okay. Well, this is a tougher audience than I'm used to, so I'll have to, <laughs> I have to think of something better. Um, uh, he um, was, uh, how many wives did we say he had? Somebody, I think, uh, Dave, 60? Okay. Well, this already was uh, shown to you, but uh, I start my story of Joseph, or Holy Joe, uh, as a money digger, a glass looker, and a con artist. And we've already seen that in, 19, in 1826, he was um, arrested. Let's see. He was uh, arrested for uh, a misdemeanor and convicted of glass. Uh, this is Joseph Smith, the glass looker. And um, the charges, which were brought in by the state of New York versus Joseph Smith on March 20th, 1826. The warrant uh, was issued upon the complaint. Prisoner examined says that he had a certain stone with which he had occasionally looked at to determine where hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were, that he professed to tell in this way, in this manner, where gold mines were a distance underground. 
he had been looking through uh, this uh, stone to find lost property for three years. Uh, this was pretty lucrative, apparently, um, because this was just one of his things. He actually ultimately would be charged with at least 30 uh, crimes, uh, from misdemeanors to felony, in fact, to treason. He was charged with treason against both the state of Illinois and the state of Missouri. And um, he went on to all sorts of uh, big uh, cons. He went from glass looking to literary hoaxing. And uh, one of the first things he produced was the Book of Moron, which was, I think, by the time of the first printing, it was changed to Mormon. But uh, I'm saying this not just to be facetious. I think there are some real reasons to think that this was done as a, as a joke at first. And like Scientology, it was a joke that was not realized to be a joke. And so uh, he then just built upon it. And the rest is history and an enormous financial empire. The first edition of the Book of Mormon, and it now has the second M in it, uh, was in 1830. And as you can see, uh, it, it says here, um, by Joseph Smith, Jr., author, and very curious term, proprietor. Uh, it, it sounds really like this is a business enterprise that we are entering. The Book of Moron, uh, Mormon, <laughs> as you already know, uh, tells of gold plates which were uh, discovered in this glacial drumlin in upstate New York or western New York uh, near Palmyra. A drumlin is a glacial uh, hill that was overrun by a readvance of the glacier and they're sort of smeared out like teardrops. And there's a great field of drumlins around Palmyra. At the top of the uh, hill is a monument. And of course, there is an angel, Moroni, at the top of that pillar. The gold plates. Smith claimed that the angel Moroni led him to these gold plates, uh, which were inscribed in a, uh, <clears throat> a mysterious language which he called Reformed Egyptian. Now, this is kind of weird um, because ordinary Egyptian at that time could not be read. And exactly what Reformed Egyptian might be is anybody's guess. But what was surprising, I think, was that these plates were not inscribed in Hebrew. Because after all, everybody knows that God's native tongue is Hebrew. Um, Adam and Eve certainly spoke Hebrew. And the snake, I would think, also must have been speaking Hebrew. So um, why, why these were in Reformed Egyptian? Well, you guessed it, of course. Simply nobody else could read them. And there would never be any danger of Smith being gainsaid. Although, of course, as you know, just to be safe, <laughs> Moroni took the plates back to heaven, or back to Kolob, just to be just to be safe. The Reformed Egyptian, uh, we know that Smith made several transcriptions, um, or he wrote out uh, bunches of characters that were alleged to come from the gold plates. Uh, apparently, the picture that you're seeing right now is a forgery. But we do know that something very much like this uh, existed, and probably two or three copies existed, which Joseph's uh, henchman took to the East Coast to show to famous scholars, uh, philologers, and so on. And of course, <laughs> none of them could make sense out of it, although they all recognized these as made up characters, probably derived from the English alphabet and the set of numerals. Now, I think, as I said, that the Book of Mormon should originally have been the Book of Moron. And I also think that it was a joke. 
And Smith was trying to see how far he could pull people's legs. And at some point he found, wow, I can make, really make money doing this. And so it turned into a religion. But as a, sort of a, a fossil buried in the Book of Mormon, we have some interesting passages in the Book of Ether. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, Coriantor was the son of Moron, and Moron was the son of Ethem. Ether, chapter 7, verse 5, and when he, the wicked Korihor, had gathered together an army, he came up onto the land of Moron, where the king of the Morons dwelt, <laughs> and took him captive. Which brought, him, which brought to pass the saying of the brother of Jared that they would be brought into captivity. Now the land of Moron, where the king dwelt, that was the king of the Morons, in case you'd forgotten already, uh, <clears throat> was near the land which is called Desolation by the Nephites. Tell me that's not a joke. Well, as you see from the quotations from the book of Ether, Mark Twain had the wrong anesthetic in mind when he called the Book of Mormon chloroform in print. Actually, it was the Book of Ether that was in print. Well, just how far can you pull people's leg? He has a story populating the Americas, and as you already know, uh, there are a number of life likely models from which these stories um, were developed. Um, but anyway, the story is some people, the Jaredites, fled from the Tower of Babel and floated in lighted barrels across the Pacific Ocean, actually across the Indian Ocean, in fact, right where they're still looking for that airliner, um, in lighted barrels across the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of South America. Uh, another part of it tells us of naughty Jews who were turned into Indians with dark skin because of sin. Jaredites, as I've said, from the Tower of Babel, they built eight large barge barrels lighted with 16 luminous stones, and they float to the Americas, again across the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Um, all, all eight of them miraculously stayed floating together, by the way. That was the real miracle here. And the Lord said, Behold, thou shalt make a hole in the top, and also in the bottom. These are bung holes. And when thou shalt suffer for air, thou shalt unstop the hole and receive air. That unstop the hole at the top of the barrel um, and get the air. And when water comes in because the barrel is rolled over, then you stop that one up because it's the bottom bung hole. And if it be so that the water come in upon thee, behold, ye shall stop the hole that ye may not perish in the flood. Now, I think that from these beholds that we have here, that actually this must have been relating to a diagram that God was showing them, um, and uh, that it just didn't make it into the illustrations that we now have in the Mormon Book of Abraham. So we're missing an illustration. Perhaps somebody will find one of these, will find this diagram and be able to make some money uh, with, the, uh, with it, with the Mormon church. We'll stretch the leg further. The prophet Lehi flees from Jerusalem in 600 BCE. He and his family make it to Arabia, build a ship, and cross the Pacific Ocean to the Americas. Lehi's sons, Nephi and Laman, quarrel, separate, become mighty nations with steel weapons and European domestic animals, all in a few years' time. Uh, the Lamanites become wicked, and God darkens their skin and turns them into atheists. Uh, no, it turns them into Indians, excuse me. That was a queer fl the slip of the tongue. Well, after the production and success of the Book of Mormon, uh, Smith went on to the discovery of the Book of Abraham, which I want to focus on now. In 1835, uh, a man by the name of Michael Chandler 
brought some mummies and papyri to Kirtland, Ohio. And Joseph Smith, seeing them, told him, he says, that one of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham and another the writings of Joseph of Egypt. Convenient. Chandler um, at Kirtland, Ohio, um, with the mummies and Egyptian papyri, uh, sold these to Smith, and he wrote this document out, which is signed Michael Chandler, and the substance of this is that uh, Smith's translation of these papyri is in complete accord with that of the best scholars on the East Coast, and uh, that uh, it is in many ways the best translation that uh, Chandler has seen. And of course, nobody could read it, so, but this was good advertising. Also in 1835, a guy by the name of Josiah Quincy comes to uh, Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, the Mormons are in, in, in Kirtland, near, um, uh, near Cleveland. And Smith tells Quincy, uh, these are hieroglyphics. Nobody can read them but myself. I can read all writings and all hieroglyphics. He was very much like me. <laughs> well, the birth of the Book of Abraham. It was published in three installments in a Mormon journal called Times and Seasons. And here uh, we have what is called facsimile one, we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, on the cover. And uh, there were also two other installments. The first was, uh, let's see, March 1st and 15th, and then the last one, the third one, on May 16th of 1842. <laughs> this is just two years before Smith's death. The Book of Abraham is now one of the so-called four standard works of the church. Uh, is part of what is called the Pearl of Great Price. And you can see that the Great Price has been reduced, has been slashed. <laughs> well, you already know this, but I have to say it now. Mormon scriptures come with pictures. Here is facsimile one again, which we've just seen on the cover of the journal. Um, it, um, it shows, allegedly, uh, the prophet Abraham on, a, on an altar about to be sacrificed by a wicked priest of the Egyptians with a knife, and here is an angel of the Lord who's going to save uh, Joseph Smith. Uh, no. He's going to save Abraham. Facsimile 2 is also pretty interesting. Uh, it's circular, and uh, we are told that right in the center uh, is Kolob, God uh, on, on his home planet of Kolob. Um, I might just back up and, and tell you before we proceed that uh, within about 15 years of, of Smith's translation, uh, it became known even in the wilds of Ohio that Champollion in France had deciphered the hieroglyphics. Uh, and um, some scholars, even here now in Ohio and in Illinois, um, were beginning uh, to, to uh, see that these things weren't what Smith said, even though they couldn't necessarily read them well. Uh, they said, no, this isn't an altar. This is a, um, an embalming table. This is not a wicked priest. It should have the head not of a man, but a head of a jackal. It should be Anubis, the god. And this should not have the head of a bird. It should have the head of a man, and it should be the man's Ba, one of his three spirits. Uh, this object was not a papyrus. It was a hypocephalus disc. This would be something made of papyrus and gesso which would be put under the head of the mummy, and it had various incantations on it, um, as we'll see, um, to be uh, used in the resurrection of the body. Facsimile three. Uh, Smith says this is Abraham on Pharaoh's throne, and here wearing a dress is Pharaoh. <laughs> and uh, this over here is, of course, since he's black, 
uh, is a slave. Again, the real Egyptologists began to realize, no, this is Osiris, this is Isis, this is Ma'at, uh, this is Horus, and this should not have that kind of a head. This should be Anubis, the jackal god. Bombshell. A microfilm of what is now called the Egyptian alphabet and grammar is given to Gerald and Sandra Tanner by an unknown, yet as far as I'm aware, a yet unknown uh, Brigham Young University student in 1965. This was a bombshell. Grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language in a vertical column are various uh, slides, uh, various, uh, various characters allegedly copied from the lost papyri. Uh, by the way, not all of this is in Joseph Smith's handwriting. Some of it is in his handwriting. Uh, some is in the handwriting of two or three of his secretaries. A year later, in 1966, the, Ch the Tanners published the, a microfilm print of this, of the, of this uh, document, and I bought it. This allowed me, and all everybody else, to see how Smith went about, quote, translating the Mormon Book of Abraham, and it allowed us all to see, without a shadow of a doubt, that Smith was a total hoax, a total fraud. He could no more read Egyptian than could the garbage collector. To give you an example, a single character here, which looks like a backward capital E in English, here is written out 66 words of English that allegedly translate that one character. Uh, and, and by the way, I should mention that this character, although by itself it can stand for water in Egyptian, it also is used as what is called a determinative, which is just sort of a, a clue-giving character as to what the remaining characters in a word mean. In this case, it has something to do with water, whether it be a, a sea or pool or, or um, milk or whatever. It, it, it has to do with liquid. Anyway, it says, it was made in the form of a bedstead, such as was had amongst the Chaldeans, blah, blah, blah. Remember that, it was made in the form of a bedstead. Well, <clears throat> as you already know, the Book of Abraham is notorious, or infamous, find the proper, the proper word, because of its anti-Negro doctrines, its anti uh, it's racist um, doc dogmas and doctrines. And lo and behold, in the book, in, in the Egyptian book of uh, the Egyptian alphabet and grammar, we have the handwriting of those passages, and this is a transcription, which is, you can't read any of those, so here it is in large enough so we can read it. The text of Abraham chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, that established by the fathers in the first generations in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam and also of Noah, his father, who blessed him with the blessings of the earth, but cursed him as pertaining to the priesthood. Now Pharaoh, being of that lineage by which he could not have the right of priesthood, notwithstanding the Pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah, through Ham, you heard of Ham and the curse of Ham and the Creation Museum of Ham. Um, <laughs> the curse of Ham, by the way, was the argument used by the mainline Christian churches to justify slavery and why black people should be enslaved. It was all because of the curse of Ham. So this showed that the racist doctrine was related uh, to this Egyptian alphabet and grammar, and in turn to the papyri that were lost. Um, one other thing I said that Mormon scriptures come with pictures, uh, they also come with uh, legends uh, for those pictures. 
And those, leg those, those the legends for those pictures are part of the text of the, of the scripture. Uh, it was made in the form of a bedstead, such as was had among the Chaldeans. You remember that. And here it is in the text. Um, this refers to figure one, uh, facsimile one. Uh, it was made in the form of a bedstead. And it said that you may have an understanding of these gods. I have given you the fashion of them in the figures at the beginning, which manner of figures is called by the Chaldeans, Rahlenos, which signifies hieroglyphics. <laughs> now, um, I think probably he wanted to have footnotes in this also and, and a, a comprehensive bibliography, but those didn't show up in the first edition. So, but maybe in later editions of the Book of Abraham, we'll have a full scholarly apparatus. Here was a bombshell, another bombshell. In the Egyptian alphabet and grammar was a sketch of the circular figure, uh, facsimile two. But it says time done, how is that possible? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I'm a third of the way into my show, so um, um, I wanted to simply show that all of the outside is missing, whereas we have text here. The text that is put in in the printed edition, which is missing here, is a different type of script. This is uh, a cursive script, uh, hieratic, and uh, instead of hieroglyphic, uh, facsimile 2 over here has legible hieroglyphs and they can be read and could be read already by the turn of the 20th century. It's a good Christian message. Mighty bull who can copulate without equal. I believe this was a prophecy of the coming of Brigham Young. <laughs> Actually, maybe the second coming of Brigham Young. Or the third coming of Brigham Young, or, or the fourth, or the fifth. The figures underwent some a modification before being printed. Uh, as you see here, the snake that has two legs and stands upright in the original uh, should have an erection, a, a so-called ithephalic, uh, and Osiris seated also should have an erection, but in the printed uh, versions, they are sexless. Well, this figure, supposedly a knife, scholars said there's something missing here, that there shouldn't be a knife, but maybe something else going upward. <laughs> and this is what it should have been. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're going to have a, re, a, a resurrection uh, you'd want to have that in order to have a re-erection. Well, the angel Moroni had taken the golden plates back to heaven, so nobody could check it. But what happened to the papyri and the mummies? It was the belief, and I guess the hope of the Mormons, that they had all burned up in the Chicago fire of 81. On November 27th, the real bomb went off, 1967. The Book of Abraham source papyri are found in the Metropolitan Museum of, New of Art in New York City. And the papyri are given, so to speak, to the Mormon church. Now it is possible to see how well Holy Joe could translate the Egyptian. One of the papyri is, a fac is the original for the facsimile of fac uh, for facsimile one. And here I've taken this uh, illustration from a signature book which is available in our bookstore uh, from um, um, 
Oh dear me. From signature books. And it shows the addition to the papyrus. And the anti-Negro doctrine actually comes from a hole in the papyrus. If you copy out all of the characters from the Egyptian alphabet and grammar and copy the actual characters from the uh, papyrus, you find that there are more characters here than there are in the papyrus. And there's this gap. It is from that gap that the anti-Negro doctrine is derived. And that was what, what we've seen already. So the racist doctrines of the Book of Abraham became increasingly problematic with the civil rights movement. Uh, the Mormon apostle Ezra, Ezra Taft Benson says this is all communist plans, the civil rights movement. But illustrated, Science illustra Sports Illustrated said that what really was basketball from hell was the Cougars you know, were being picketed, so to speak, on their basketball tours and somebody actually poured uh, lighter fluid on the floor, on the gym floor, and set it alight. Something had to be done, and quickly. The prophets here in Revelator Kimball gets the word on June 9th, and the Mormon priesthood will be white and delightsome, no more. All worthy males can do it. The apologist strategies came up with all kinds of ideas. And I wanted to imagine what Joseph Smith might have done if he had not been killed on, in 44. But probably the most important thing is that he might have come up with bikini versions of this. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry to have been overcome. <laughs>